Rowan lived with her mother Colleen, her stepfather David Spears, and David's longtime friend Chris Collings in Missouri. Chris lived in the basement of the family's home, and Rowan embraced him like part of the family. She gave him the nickname Uncle Chris and treated him just like she would a blood relative. In late 2007, Chris moved out of the basement and into a trailer on his family's farm. Despite no longer living with the family, his bond remained close with Rowan. He would see her often, as he was still a close friend and co-worker of her stepfather David. Unfortunately, this relationship would take a drastic turn. On November 2, 2007, David Spears and Chris Collings met up with a mutual friend and co-worker Nathan Meharan to hang out, drink some beer, and relax at David's house. At around 8.30, Rowan's mother Colleen left for her overnight shift. Colleen knew that her husband and his friends were at the house playing pool, and felt at peace knowing someone would be there to keep an eye on Rowan. Nothing was unusual or out of the ordinary. David, Chris, and Nathan continued to drink heavily. The group was pretty drunk, but Nathan asked Chris for a ride home as it was getting late. Chris and Nathan didn't want to leave their buddy David alone and convinced him to come along for the drive even though this meant Rowan, a fourth grader, would be home by herself. On the way to Nathan's place, the group of men made another pit stop for alcohol and smoked some weed. After several hours, Nathan dropped David back at his house. The next day, Colleen returned home at 9 a.m. after working a long shift. She expected to be greeted by Rowan like she normally would, but Rowan wasn't there. Colleen searched the house calling for her daughter, but Rowan didn't answer. David was asleep in the primary bedroom and was woken up from his sleep by Colleen asking where Rowan was. David responded that Rowan had stayed the night with a few friends and wasn't back yet. When Colleen asked which friend she had stayed with, David had no answer. Once the afternoon rolled around and Rowan still wasn't home and had made no attempt to call the house, Colleen called the Newton County Sheriff's Department and reported her daughter was missing. A community-wide search began almost immediately. The local news took the story and ran, hoping that someone would come forward with any information. The community was on high alert. The police talked to Chris in a parking lot where he told them what the three men got up to that night. Chris seemed surprised by this encounter with police and claimed he had no clue Rowan was even missing until he was approached. He also mentioned that he had not been in contact with David after he and Nathan had left his home. Chris made it clear that he had no idea where Rowan could be and was incredibly cooperative, even visiting Colleen and offering help in the search. By November 5th, Rowan was still missing. The FBI was called to aid in the search and investigation. Once again the police asked to interview Chris. He agreed and drove himself to the sheriff's department to make another statement and go over where he was on the night of Rowan's disappearance. Chris continued his adamant stance that he had no knowledge of Rowan's whereabouts and even offered to take a polygraph test and a CVSA computer voice stress analysis. On the afternoon of the 5th, during a routine patrol, Chris flagged down the attention of Chief Clark. Chris and the chief were friends and had known each other for over 17 years. The chief was close with Chris's adoptive parents and had known him since he was a young kid. Chief Clark stopped and greeted his friend. Chris filled him in on the current talk of the town, Rowan's disappearance. His demeanor was starkly opposite to how anyone would act in this type of situation. Clark noticed that Chris seemed almost enthusiastic. He was excited to tell him about the missing girl. Chris had always looked to the chief for support, especially during the passing of his mother. He felt comfortable being vulnerable with him and during this interaction, it was clear to the officer that Chris knew more than he was letting on. Soon after, Chief Clark contacted the FBI working on Rowan's case to inform them of the bizarre conversation he and Chris Collings had. The FBI encouraged Clark to continue to speak with Chris about the case in hopes of gaining more information and hopefully Rowan's location. That evening Chris went over to Collings' house where police intended to interview both of them separately. Chris once again gave a nearly identical report as he had before, except this time he confessed that David knew more than he was telling the police. He offered to wear a wire around his friend to coax a confession out of him. The police took this accusation very seriously and as David Spears was already on the persons of interest list, they delved even deeper into investigating him. He was continuously questioned, searched, and even driven around the area by the police to aid their search for Rowan. Chris consented to a DNA swab and another set of questioning by the FBI. However, this time he grew more and more emotional. 
He told the FBI that if they were going to accuse him, he would refuse to speak with them. After this interview, Chris went to Chief Clark's office to complain about his treatment during the FBI interview. He broke down to Clark, claiming that he would never intentionally do anything to hurt Rowan. Another officer entered Clark's office and Chris ran out. It was clear to anyone on the case that Chris was beginning to crack. On November 9, 2007, just one week after Rowan's disappearance, investigators made a horrific discovery. In a heavily wooded area about 30 feet from the road, a sinkhole known as Fox Cave was looked into. At the bottom was the body of Rowan Ford. It looked as though Rowan's body had been hastily covered with leaves, but once search parties came upon it, they knew exactly what it was. She was unclothed from the waist down. All that remained on her body was a singular sock. Around her neck were ligature marks, bruises, and scrapes all over her body, and her private areas were lacerated from front to back. The autopsy report stated that it was clear Rowan had been sexually assaulted before her death. Her cause of death was strangulation. Chief Clark heard the news and went to find Chris. Chris had already called Clark in a panic, claiming that a gray minivan had been following him around all day. On the call, the chief asked Chris to come into the station if he felt unsafe. Chris agreed, and once there, the chief gave him the news. Rowan's body had been uncovered at the bottom of a sinkhole in the middle of the forest. Based on previous conversations the two had, Chief Clark believed that David was the person responsible for Rowan's death, but that Chris was trying to protect his friend. Chris suggested that he and Chief Clark go for a drive to talk about things, not around the chaos in the police department. Clark let other law enforcement know where they were headed, and the two drove just outside of town. Once at the Muncie Bridge, Chris extended his hands as if to say, cuff me. Chief Clark said there was no need for that. Chris responded, for what I'm about to tell you, you will. That is when the truth was revealed. On the night David, Nathan, and Chris hung out, Chris knew that once David and Nathan left, if he took a shortcut, he could make it back to David's house to grab Rowan without the other men knowing. Once there, he snuck into Rowan's room while she was sleeping and carried her into his pickup truck. She remained asleep as he drove back to his trailer. He carried her into the bedroom, kept the lights off so Rowan wouldn't be able to see, and took off her PJ pants and underwear. The 300-pound grown man proceeded to sexually assault the nine-year-old girl, causing her to wake up with fear and confusion. She didn't know where she was. She didn't know who was doing this to her. She couldn't see and Chris never made a sound. After he was done he claimed that he wanted to bring Rowan back home. He grabbed her arms and turned her away from him so she couldn't see his face. She fought against him, turned, and realized who it was. It was her uncle Chris. At that moment Chris knew he was caught. He wouldn't be able to get out of this. She had seen his face. She knew who had done this to her. Close by was some loose chicken wire which he grabbed and tightly tied around Rowan's neck. She fought for as long as she could but eventually, she stopped moving. At this point, Chris didn't know what to do. He scooped up Rowan's body, put her in the car, and started driving around while he thought of the next move. Chris drove to Fox Cave, threw Rowan's body into the nearly 20-foot sinkhole, and tried to cover her body with leaves, branches, and anything he could find on the forest floor. He returned to his home where he realized all of the incriminating evidence was out in the open. Blood was on his mattress, the chicken wire used to strangle the nine-year-old girl, her underwear and pajamas, and knew he had to destroy the evidence. He burned everything except the mattress in a small fire, rolled up the mattress with some old carpet, stuffed it in a large drum, and set it ablaze in a barn. Chief Clark was shocked by his admission, but that didn't stop him from letting Chris Collings ride in the front seat of his police car and smoke a cigarette while they drove back to the station for a filmed confession. Investigators brought David in once again to be questioned, and this time he admitted that he and Chris sexually assaulted Rowan together, and he watched him kill her, and the two threw her body away. Surprisingly, Chris denied that David had anything to do with any of the atrocious acts that took place, but David stood by his admission. In 2012, Chris Collings was convicted of first-degree murder. Witness testimonies from Chris's family continue to bring up his difficult childhood and his difficulties being adopted. Chris also stated that he was developmentally disabled and was diagnosed with severe disorganized dissociative attachment disorder and explosive personality disorder. On top of this, 
Chris tried to suppress any statements taken in those interviews, as well as any evidence found linking him to the crime. This motion was overruled and the jury recommended a death sentence. Chris Collings was found guilty and sentenced to death in the state of Missouri. As for David Spears, there was not enough evidence to put both he and Chris for the murder of Rowan and therefore was sentenced to just 11 years in prison.